Hi, good morning. I don't have any relevant complications, but this is a multi-center international study that was funded by Bow Cancer, uh, Bow Research UK, Birmingham Surgical Trials Consortium. Uh, none of the investigators were paid for involvement. So diverticulitis has a wide spectrum of disease and symptoms under the broad definition. And the expansive presentation has made it difficult to develop common standards and common international guidelines for treatment. There's also epidemiologic changes and demographic shifts towards younger patients and different definitions of acute diverticulitis, what's complicated, what's uncomplicated, how to best treat, and when to operate. What we all know is that it's common and it's costly. It's also increasing in incidence in the United States and worldwide. It's currently the third most common inpatient diagnosis, second most common ER diagnosis, with a 55% increase in emergency admissions over the last decade. Annual costs in the US alone are over $2 billion, and it remains a leading indication for colectomy. There's wide variations in practice and outcomes worldwide that we know of, but comparisons have only been made across the US, the UK, and Australia. The other thing that we know is even though elective surgery is increasing, the number of emergency surgeries hasn't decreased, and the number of stomas made also hasn't decreased. So with this international variation in guidelines and practice, it's a disease that's ripe to examine the global trends and variations in practice. That's the goal of the Damascus trial, to prospectively determine national and international variation in initial treatment and outcomes with acute diverticulitis. We secondarily looked at 30-day and six-month readmission and reintervention rates, and we're going to determine the failure rate associated with conservative strategies, as well as the impact of COVID-19 on management. It was global recruitment over a six-month period for a CT-proven acute diverticulitis, so any patient with any severity and any history of diverticulitis that presents either as an inpatient or outpatient uh, to the emergency department, hospital, or clinic, uh, could be enrolled. And questions are admissions versus discharge and surgery versus no surgery. We looked at the index baseline factors for the patient and disease, as well as the index management decisions, 30-day and six-month follow-ups. Six-month period started in October 1st of 2020 with rolling starts um, and then ended in August 31st of 2021. We stopped enrolling new sites in February. We used data collection with a red cap system and four case report forms. So this was free for investigators internationally to enroll and to keep patients involved. Uh, and again, regardless of history, severity, or initial management, um, patients could be enrolled. Diagnosis was done either by CT or by appearance in the OR, and interventions that were considered are seen here. Now, as patients went through, um, criteria for inclusion were CT-proven diverticulitis, undergoing surgery, or suspected complications. Patients had to be able to fill out and agree to baseline CRFs, and initial data management was reported. And that's where we stopped for this initial study, and you can see the variables that we used. This is um, a view of the case report forms of just how easy it is to complete this. The entire study cost about $30,000. Um, and this is all online through Secure REDCap. We use descriptive statistics to look at the results, means, medians, and continuous data, and frequencies for categorical. And ethics was pretty facile to do. In the UK, none was needed because it was just an audit study. In the US and other sites, it was by center. And you can see the main outcome measures for here again. But what we're really looking for is the variations in clinical practice at the country and continent level. So in this six-month period, we were able to recruit 1,200-plus users, looking at more than 6,000 patients in 48 countries. And the recruitment continued steady over time. We could have even had more if we continued the study period. We had data at the time of the presentation completely cleaned for over 5,600 patients, mean age of 60, and more than half were female. Um, great majority were Caucasian and overweight or obese, and 20% were active smokers. And you can see the breakdown by region here. Uh, more than 28% had had a prior diverticular admission, significantly more in the U.S. and North America. 
With so much data, I thought it would be easiest to look at it through flowcharts. So CAT scan was performed for the diagnosis in 98% of patients, significantly higher um, in the US and North America and lower in the rest of the world regions. Sigmoid was most affected region in the majority of areas except for the rest of the world countries where 11% were right-sided disease. And more than 50% of patients were um, uncomplicated. Now, as far as care breakdown, 20% were ambulatory and 80% were inpatient. The greatest change was seen in North America where 61% were treated as outpatients. In other regions, it was 4 to 31%. For those treated ambulatory, the great majority had antibiotics. Almost all received painkillers as well. Just a few received anti-inflammatory medications and very few percutaneous drainage. For those that got inpatient treatment, again, nearly all had antibiotics. Uh, very few got anti-inflammatories for pain management. A great amount of them got opioids for pain management, though. And 13% underwent surgery. For those that had surgery, the majority were open cases. 12% had a lavage only, and 88% had a resection. So 67% had an end stoma. Of those that had a primary anastomosis, you can see the case breakdown with 24% uh, having a covering stoma and 8% having a drain left. And you can see, looking by region, that there's great variety just in the cases that we see, especially for the ambulatory treatment, the amount of patients that had NSAIDs, and the percentage that had surgery and initial presentation. So I didn't want to do conclusions because this is just the initial data scrape off the surface of a huge data set. So next we're going to look at length of stay, 30-day outcomes, six-month follow-up data um, that was completely entered in February of 2020, as well as the relationship of treatment decisions and outcomes. And we're starting to publish on the initial findings as well as starting studies in subgroups like East of Damascus, um, Explodes, which is a genomic study, and Damascus II, which looks at quality of life. And I think that this is especially valuable as a model for future collaborative studies. We don't see a lot of these studies in the US, but they're pretty common in Europe. And this was fast and relatively painless to organize. More than 280 sites looking at real world prospective granular data. So it shows the power of collaborative research. It was efficient, it was very cost effective, and it was also inclusive. Um, we had a very valuable international steering committee, and we'll be able to spin it off into many sub studies. So these are all of our participating groups and funders, so thank you to them and to all our country leads.